Hello everyone and welcome to the Dice Commando YouTube channel. I'm Andrew with you here as always. This is Go Again, a fabulous video cast covering the trading card game Flesh and Blood. This video and others like this one are possible thanks to viewers like you. Please show your support with a like and subscribe and be sure to hit the bell notification icon so you don't miss any new videos. If you want to get involved with the channel, consider becoming a channel member. There are many benefits to channel membership including access to our Discord, exclusive deck tech and strategy videos, and the opportunity to help create channel content. I want to sincerely thank all our channel members, as I truly couldn't do this without your support. You guys rock. Go Commando! Hello everyone, welcome to Dice Commando and Go Again, a fabulous cast. I'm Andrew with you here as always. With me tonight, very exciting episode, I've got Josh, the intern. How are you doing, man? Doing great, how are you? I'm doing well, because we are here with Jake. Jake is the top rank U.S. player, and interestingly enough, the first guy to break the 1,000 barrier in the U.S. How are you doing tonight, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, bud. All right, so, you know, we are, we are going to dive into uh, basically everything this man knows about Fab, kind of learn about him, and uh, we're going to break it down, so we'll be right back. Hey folks, welcome back. Thanks for joining us today. Very, very exciting uh, three-man episode. Look how this little cast keeps growing, at least in terms of uh, in terms of numbers. Uh, so I just want to remind everybody that you know, with Monarch approaching, uh, pre-orders, getting those in. Uh, I get all my sealed product. We get all of our sealed product from Gone Guy Games. That's my LGS. Uh, Josh has even gotten some stuff from them as well. They also keep things going, even though even though we're closed, still under lockdown right now. We're still running tournaments from them. And it was just announced today that they actually have a pre-release, which is which is very exciting. And also for those singles that you need coming out of Monarch, my buddies over at Fab Foundry, if you use the uh, link in the description below, they actually give the channel a small kickback, which helps support us as well. So give them a check out. So with all that said, all the excitement is on. It's with Jake. I mean, so how, how's it how's it feel to, you know, that's, You've probably got people hitting you up. Maybe you're a local superstar, countrywide superstar. How's how, how's it feel, man? Well, um, honestly, it's kind of surreal. Um, I've been playing the game for about a year now, and you know, it was always kind of a running joke locally. Like, yeah, I'm gonna do it, or you know, I'm number one on the leaderboard. But we were early adopters, so no one was playing, and you know, it was kind of just the local scene was the leaderboard. Um, Towards the end or the beginning of skirmish season, um, it actually became a real challenge um, because the events carried a lot of weight and they were accessible to everyone. Um, and so we have a lot of great players in America. Um, you know, a lot of people know of Davis, Rob Seigel, and um, you know, it really pushed me to make it a goal instead of just a joke. And so actually hitting the goal feels because I wasn't fortunate enough to play in as many of the skirmish events as I would like to have. Um, but even so, I was able to overcome with people who were playing every day or in multiple every day. Okay, so that, that's a that's a good thing. And I actually want to ask you about that a little later. But, you know, in the meantime, I think, you know, we've got the opportunity with you here in front of the screen. Um, you know, who, who, who are you, you know, as a person? Like, what's, what's your background? Uh, you know, you said you got into fab a year ago. Like, what's... You know what? What do you like to do? Who Who are you, man? Just you know, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, simple guy. Um, from Cali, live in Houston. Um, I stack bananas for a living, or work in the produce section of HEB. Um, play lots of games. Um, Warhammer. Uh, wasn't really into card games. Was more into tabletop games. So, and um, you know, I I forget why, but because of COVID, I was just kind of wasting some time at a comic shop. I didn't know they were open. And uh, they kind of showed me fab, got into it, and stuff from there. Never been a card collector, never knew anything of card value um, until uh, getting into fab. Um, you know, just kind of you know, play drums, listen to music. Um, you know, nothing special. Um, uh, fab kind of has become my personality recently, though. You know, for the last year, this is all I've done, four nights a week. Um, at a minimum, uh, in fact, you know, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, 
I was playing, I played 11 events um, last week, 12 the week before, um, you know, so, you know, as of now, I'm, I'm, I'm just fab, you know, like flesh and blood and, and the community around it. That's, that's what I'm doing. So that's, I, I actually, it didn't, when you first said that, it didn't click to me. You said you got into it a year ago. And cause I think a lot of us who are still under lockdown and, you know, a lot of the people watching this live in parts of the globe that haven't been in it for long, but it just clicked to me. You, you actually picked this up after us COVID response started then. Is, yes. is that correct? Correct. So how, that's an interesting experience. How is that? Uh, yeah, I don't even know how to frame that question. I'm sorry. I mean, how? Yeah, tell us about that. That's very interesting. Not having been in this before lockdown started. So I was actually doing uh, Dungeons and Dragons like really heavily. Uh, I was kind of like a semi-professional uh, DM where I was running groups and and you know kind of just off the internet and people paying me for it. And because of COVID, I couldn't do that anymore. So I had a bunch of extra free time, and you know I used to go to the comic shop. With pain you know uh if it wasn't for covid and shutting down get-togethers or gatherings i definitely wouldn't have gotten into flesh and blood fascinating um, yeah because um, uh they you know they pitched me the cards as a way to just waste time at the shop and i was like you know my girlfriend plays games she'll love this game let me buy some thinking we'd play in isolation Okay, so now I have another question for you. See, see, I told you this was going to go. So uh, when when the game, so you mentioned your girlfriend. That's where my question was. So when Fab first came out, actually, my, my wife and I, Amy, uh, we we got into it together. And, uh, you know, because of the, I, I mean, when it first came out, we, we didn't realize the complication level of Fab. I mean, it's a very complicated game. I don't think that's a secret. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, you know, it was more my style game, and, and she didn't really, it, it wasn't really her jam. Um, has that been, you know, how, how has that evolved through your, your personal relationship, your, your casual games? How is that have, cause I was unsuccessful at maintaining a casual level of gaming with her. She just wasn't interested. Have you, have you been able to maintain that? How, how did that evolve? Um, well, she naturally, uh, like we're naturally competitive with each other, like over the stupid shit, like, you know, a dice roll or playing Mario Kart or anything like that, like such trivial stuff it's just like oh yeah i'm better than you so like when it came to a competitive card game uh she was she was interested in trying to one-up me so learning for her was really easy um you can ask josh uh she's yeah as a, as a third party i can tell you she talks more smack than jake does yeah, and yeah. she backs it up a fair amount of the time so yeah. she's not to be taken lightly yeah, absolutely. Uh, she, I, you know, I call her my little champion because uh, she's beaten me and knocked me out of finals uh, like at least four or five times. Well, that's that's awesome. I mean, my my wife's beat me plenty in uh, in Destiny, but uh, not not in Fab. Yeah. It's just you know different different games oh, speak yeah, to different yeah, peoples, right? Different yeah. Well, cool. Uh, so, Josh, before I get into my questions, did you have anything you wanted? I mean, you're. I, you know, we have to throw out. Josh made me do it. It's 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 my fault. Josh told me we had to do it. I, I heard Josh beat you last night. That's that's what I heard. Absolutely. In the interest of full disclosure, it's only the third time ever I've beaten Jake, but it was probably one of the most satisfying matches I've ever been in. Not just because I won, to be honest, but because I thought it was a very well-played game on both of our sides. And it came down to, like most games, one or two things would have happened differently. The outcome would have been different, but I felt like... I was making good decisions. I know Jake is always going to make the best possible decisions, so it was, it was a fun challenge. But I'm glad to have gotten one over you. Oh, no, it was great. Uh, definitely a good game. Um, I'm glad we ended up playing in the finals, actually. Yeah. Um, and you got a date at all? Yeah, I did. I got a foil, uh, or, you know, the foil data doll, which now I have to figure out if I can even build the deck with her. So. Good oh, luck with that, yeah. dude. Okay. Good luck with that. Uh, who sings the new meta? You heard it here first. <laughs> All right. So, Josh, did you have any questions before I uh, get into mine? And not that, not that you can't interject, but um, do you have any questions? Uh, well, just to kind of touch on, because you, you had kind of alluded to it a little bit about how Jake got into it, you know, after COVID, and, and so did I, actually, uh, in like June or July. And how that happened is that there were stores that were in counties that weren't in lockdown, 
And for me, I, I've been driving almost 45 miles one way just to get there. These stores gave us the opportunity to play, and it was a way to kind of circumvent the, uh, the restrictions a little bit and get some game in. So I, I've been really thankful that the, those stores have built a community for Fab that stayed strong. We we go from eight to 14 people most weeknights, and that's been consistent for the entire time I've been playing. So, and I know Jake has done a lot to build the community, not just at the store that we that I typically patronage, but also uh, another location in, in Houston to build that Fab uh, community on non-competing nights. So I think there's a lot of people in our local area that have made it possible for a lot of people in the Houston area to get games in and get reps, and that's why we were on the leaderboards for the longest time until skirmish came in. Yeah, fair enough. So, do, do you want to guys? Do you guys want to give? It's it's actually really nice that your stores don't try and compete with each other because it, it sounds obvious to us as players, but a lot of times stores do. So that's really nice. Do you want to uh, give those stores some shout outs here? Oh, absolutely. Uh, Fat Ogre Games and Comics uh, in the Woodlands, and then Dragon Slayer of North uh, over in Tomball. Um, without them, I don't. I don't think the Houston scene would be alive, and you know this might sound a little bit uh, braggadocious, but like without the Houston scene, there wouldn't be a Texas scene. I honestly think we were the first in North America to get our hands on the game, so kind of the whole community owes it to and Fat Ogre and, and Dragon Slayer. So that, that's interesting. I, I've actually I've actually been to Dragon's Lair. I mentioned these guys in the pre-show. I've I've been uh, I had some connections down to Houston in the past. I've actually been to Dragon's Lair. I haven't been to Fat Ogre because that's like way up there, right? In the Woodlands North Connor area. Yeah, you've guys got a loop and then another loop and then like you have to drive for three hours. Yeah, it's, it's Houston. Absolutely. For those of you who don't know the geography, Houston is like this giant freaking city. Anyway, anyway. Houston is an hour away from Houston. Yeah. So, all right. So, uh, you know, before we get into kind of kind of the meat of this or the real philosophical questions, you know, what what is your preferred um, not necessarily hero, but what is your preferred play style? And and I acknowledge that a lot of times that goes hand in hand. But what do you usually run, and uh, what do you like to do with it? Um, I would, I would so mid range. Um, coming from war games or most other strategy games I play. Um, you know, entering a tournament, you need to make a list or a deck that's one size fits all. Um, you're in FAB, we're capable of sideboarding. Um, although a lot of times I choose not to sideboard and just run the full deck. Um, but you know, a deck that it doesn't matter what you're up against, you have different strategies built into it. So I play a lot of Bravo for this reason. Um, in constructed at least in uh, Blitz, I've been running Dorinthia, and it's kind of a different story on that. But we can get into that. But generally, prior to the Blitz blowing up, um, or even in even in Blitz events and constructed when it was more popular, I'd run Bravo because I have the ability to run bigger defense reactions for cheaper with staunch response. Um, you know, and you can even pump it so it gets around dominate. It's around um, a lot of different effects um, that would stop playing multiple defense reactions or anything like that. And you can cut them, and they're worthwhile on pitch. But you also have big attacks like Crippling Crush that um, not only hurt, um, you know, because it's a large attack uh, with you know, 11 damage, but it has you know built-in control effects. So you know, as you're playing aggressively, it's still you know, building defenses in and taking cards from your opponent, and so. Even though they cost a lot, Anathos itself just swings for one blue pitch. So you can still, on any downturn, block, you know, for on average nine to greater, but still apply pressure every turn. Um, so it gives you the flexibility, or at least in Bravo or you know mid range builds, um, to kind of adapt to your opponent. You know, um, against really aggressive opponents, you just play defensively until they run out of cards, or you know against defensive opponents, you know you can kind of gauge. You know the appropriate time to apply pressure, or um, or to you know wait out the big def defense reactions, or um, you know and apply your pressure late game instead of early game against an opponent. I just think like you know, you know, mid range dash is what Matt, Matt Rogers played. You know for a reason is you know he could play control if he wanted to, and you know against playing slower decks it's dash so you can boost and play more aggressively on the induction chamber. 
I just think overall in Flesh and Blood, it's such a give and take game that you know, planning, you know, for the long game with the ability to apply early aggro pressure is the way to build the deck. Actually, I like that statement. I don't know why I haven't heard and or thought about that, but a give and take game is actually a really good statement. I think. Um, I mean, well, so you know, if if you want to do a large damage turn, you're taking damage. Yeah. You know? No, I and, mean, it makes sense, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and a lot of like, you know, Josh was saying in our game right point, like, um, you know, some some play styles or some way the, the matchup is happening is, you know, you're going to take damage, and if you can't retaliate and equal it, you can see the favor turn. Or likewise, you can easily see if you have a life lead, um, you know, that I can afford however much damage that's coming in because I know the pressure from next turn because my opponent is in a bad position. So, you know, you're constantly this ebb and flow or give and take of, you know, cards mostly, but, you know, sometimes, you know, life. Um, when it comes to making trades. Um, like, you're always giving a card to play a card or take a card from your opponent. Like, as odds are they're blocking, you know, or pitching. Like, you you know, you're just trading cards. It's a trading card game, but even in the game, you're just trading cards. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's a value-based game, right? I mean, Absolutely. yeah, if I can play one and make you spend two, that's that's the goal, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, of yeah. course, of course. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Um, all right, so my, my next question is kind of, uh, you know, if, if you know, if, if, if I'm some guy just coming into the game now and I want to be you, right, I want to be, I want to be number one, numero uno, what do you personally see as the value of, let, let me, let me change how I'm phrasing the question, same question, I'm going to phrase it differently. There, there are two philosophies out there on how to learn a game, right? One is get really, really good at one deck. And the other is play a bunch of decks so that they know how they work, so that you know how to beat them, right? What is your take on that? Do you do you do you personally prefer to hone in on one deck, or do you like to play four or five different styles so that you can really have a better idea of the field? What's what's your take on that f for Fab? Um. Well, if you just want to play the game for fun, uh, just do what makes you feel comfortable, right? You know, if you only like the ninja, play the ninja. Um, now, competitively, I think you need to put a lot of reps in with the deck or the play style you're the most comfortable with, and you should definitely focus on one. However, um, through locals, casuals, you should definitely be playing other decks. Um, if you have the cards for it, you should build it, and you should play it in your off time, or you know, if you've been on a winning streak and you feel you can get the heat from your local community, uh, you know, just play a deck for fun. Um, because, you know, especially like, let's say, Dorinthia, for for instance, you know, she, a lot of her damage comes off threat of Bilgin or the threat of attack reactions, you know, and so you defending against Dorinthia is always a gamble of, well, what's the possibility she can do? Now, if you play Dorinthia a lot, you know that to them, they might be afraid that you can do a lot on every turn, but you know how much you really can and cannot do when you're seeing your hand. And so getting that perspective um, of playing as Dorinthia help you block Dorinthia a lot better, you know, not a particular instance. So, you know, if, if you never pick up Dorinthia, you know, you might not get the nuances of reprise um, other than just seeing it as an effect that it's like, okay, I guess you're doing reprise again, you know, like you'll never get past, um, you know, singing Steel Blade not being nearly as effective if you don't block. Um, who... I think that's a pretty fair point because I think that it, if you haven't played the class and you haven't had cards in your hand and had to prioritize with these cards what's the best possible play, you begin to understand this is more optimal than this. This is my first option. This is my second option. Here's my third option. And until you've done that, you won't know how to play against it because you'll have to know, okay, if he has this, this is how I respond. So I try to set up to where I can respond to your best option. And if you don't have that card in your hand, I can still handle your second best option. And you can learn to counter and, like you were saying, block the class better because you know what kind of reads they're making as they're seeing their hands. Yeah. Like you wouldn't, you know, if you see, see Guardian or Brute play Pummel against you, right? And But you've never played either of those classes, you might just assume Pummel goes in every deck. 
um, you know, you probably wouldn't know the nuance of it only applies to clubs or two costs or greater cards, you know, if you're just playing one deck. Um, you know, there's all sorts of, um, like, Brute has Intimidate, you know, and the discard mechanic, you know. It, it just seems like if you're not looking at the cards, like, you won't know won't know the decision to make. Um, you know, I'm not someone who's big on checking someone's graveyard um, all the time. Like, I definitely want to know um, at some points, but, like, you do these things to kind of make your decisions, and if if you're not knowing the outs that the deck is looking for itself or its power turns um, because you haven't played it, you'll never know what's coming, so you can't make the appropriate decision. No, I, 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 I mean that I, I agree with you. I was just curious. I mean, I, but I'm not a top ranked player, right? So I mean, I, I've, if you know, fun. I've played a lot of games, and fundamentally, I like to play the other deck and fail, so that, you know, like in Josh's example, if you have two cards in your, like, you're like, actually, your example about Stinging Steel Blade, I think, was apt, right? It's like, all right, I have Stinging Steel Blade, and it's stuck in my hand. What did I learn from that, right? Whereas you may, not, I mean, if you'd never play, you don't, you don't know, right? So. I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. I agree. Uh, but there's a lot of people who are just like, just get really good at Ira or whatever it may be. Right. So, Uh, you know, Ira is, is one that you could say is consistent enough where all you would need to learn is Ira. Um, but ultimately you could say that for Bravo and constructed. Um, but even if you know how the class works, it's fullest, how the other classes work um and sure you're going to get that experience through playing against them um but you know like kind of in poker like if you're going to call someone's bluff if you don't know the potential if you don't know every card in their deck like or every card in 52 other percent chance of a poker hand you know you're not gonna make the right decision um and so I like to play Kano and Constructed for fun, you know, so I understand people, you know, just wanting to, you know, play one for fun or play every deck for fun, but competitively, you need, you know, repetition, like, uh, you know, just play Ira and keep going. It doesn't matter who you want to play, you need that repetition, you need that practice on pressure, you need to play against the other decks, um, but you'll have a huge advantage over someone who only plays Ira versus who puts your time in with Ira playing every other deck. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, all right, so I think, uh, Josh, do you have any questions before I hit my, my big question of the night? Yeah, one question I had, just kind of a, what, what's your favorite card as far as either just, it's fun to play or you think it's just... Red Pummel cool. all day, every day. I'll put it in Ira, I'll put it in things that doesn't belong because Command and Conquer... Plus, Red Pummel is just so fun to pull off. I'll draw one and arsenal it and sit, you know, all the way until I get either the Command and Conquer or the Pummel, and then just play it with such a grin on my face. Um, <laughs> you know, in Bravo, uh, thankfully, I you know, Pummel isn't wasted as often as you know, someone like Ninja, but, you know, for is a time... Is it more I'll fun play, because uh, of the know. discard? What's that? It's more fun because of the discard? Yeah, absolutely. Like... So, you get a card with Dominate, and then you play Pummel, so it's like, not only are you getting stuck with the damage, but now you're, you know, if you did block, right, you're losing an additional card, and you get the damage. Um, yeah. You're getting the bonus damage and the card from hand all at once. Yeah, yeah. and it's very rare, but I've been able to uh, Pummel a Crippling Crush on someone who wasn't blocking, so, you know, they lost almost all their cards. Um you know, and all that damage. It's Pummel a crippling great. crush? Yeah. Oh, man, you're a horrible, horrible, horrible person. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Absolutely, right? Um, like, uh, Bravo's a lot of fun. Uh, I will say that much. But, yeah, if, you know, like, say the gold foils or whatever that they're giving out, like, weren't just legendaries, I would ask for a, a red pummel. Maybe, you know, like an orange pummel that did five damage instead of four. <laughs> oh, did, that, that's, did you get yours yet? No, I have not. Yeah, fair, um, fair enough. I reached out to a few players who won theirs, and uh, they, they said it's a little bit, and it hasn't been that long for me. So, yeah, you know, no, I mean, that's reasonable. And 
you know, we're not exactly in an environment where global shipping is a uh, high precision machine, right? So absolutely. So yeah, we we just check the mail every day, and one day it'll show up, and that'll, that'll be awesome, right? right? No, that is awesome. All right, so standing behind your mailbox. My my big question of the night for you is being someone and you're I, I believe you're uniquely qualified to answer this being someone in in a high scoring position what is your take on fab being more of a quote unquote cumulative point system versus being like an elo system or or something like that what is, what is your take on on that well you know i would actually prefer it being an elo system um I mean, so it's it's weird. Now I benefited from this, and no matter like how many layers this is, it's going to equal to the same thing. It's kind of a moot point, but like so early on, I was ahead on the leaderboards. Um, now I, I I will say in America, it's obvious if I'm playing the most and winning the most in one central location, I'm going to be number one, right? But there was a point early on until Crucible where even just playing locally, I was still competing worldwide. I was in the I was actually number two worldwide in the summer of last year, and I didn't really drop out of the top ten worldwide um, until I want to say November. Um, and if it was Elo based, I would be ranked higher. Now because it was points based, it was obvious in America that I was going to be the highest because I was playing the most. Um, now, with skirmishes and online events, you know, whoever's playing in the most of these is going to get ranked the highest, naturally. Now, you do have to win. You can't just enter every event and lose. You won't get any points that way. You can enter every single event in five times a day and not win and you get no points, right? So you have to win to get the points. Um, but I mentioned earlier that I had to play in 11 or 12 events, um, you know, over, over the course of the last few weeks up with some people who were able to play more events and now that skirmishes are around some are rated higher than others so skirmishes were like highly sought after to get into so if you didn't sign up in time or people didn't drop like you couldn't enter them all you could try um but it was kind of like some would post and you had like 45 minutes to sign up before they filled up um so with these events being more six you know whoever can get into the most of if they're an average player with a, you know, let's say two out of three win rate, and they're in every skirmish, they're naturally going to climb the top. Um, and is that fair or not fair? Definitely not, because like I said before, I was the only one allowed to play because I was playing locally. You know, so like, it, it is it a fair system? I would say yes, because it's accessible to those who are willing to get it. But is it a representation of skill? I definitely don't think so. Um, I play a lot. I, I do definitely win a lot locally. Um, I've placed in the top eight in probably like four out of the ten skirmishes. Um, I've been in, I've won one, um, got second place in another two. Um, locally, it, you know, I probably win three out of four events. Um, my girlfriend wins the other two, you know what I mean, that I'm not at. Um, so I'm, am I the best player? Absolutely not. We have Rob Seigel, who's a great player. We have Davis Kingsley, who's a great player. Alex Plume's a great player. We have a lot of great North American players who are arguably the best player. Um, and I think that if we were running an ELO system, you would really see like who is the best. Because you know, even though Kingsley isn't playing in every event, or Davis Kingsley isn't playing in every event, he's a really great player. And I think ultimately he would be the highest um, of any leaderboard, uh, if, if it was an ELO system. Same thing with Dante Delfigo from Canada. I played against him. Uh, I've seen people who play with him. I've seen the events he's won. Um, these people are crazy. Um, and giving them just, you know, uh, you have X many XP points does not stand to their skill that they actually possess. Because, you know, I want to say I'm above average, but, you know, some of these people are really good. And my score and their score look similar, and there should be a huge difference between. I think that's one thing that that I noticed is you're a very good player with a lot of volume. And what we've seen with these skirmishes, where you've been introduced to other people, 
is there's people who may have the volume, but who are just scary good to play against. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I'm afraid of any Canadian player. All of those Canadian players are, oh, excuse me, are amazing. Um, I think, you know, I if there was an NA for Australia, New Zealand, NA would take it to be carried by the Canadian. Um, I love everyone in America. We're all great players. Um, but I mean, and Dominic and Dante are, are amazing. Um, they're absolutely amazing. Uh, and I'm pretty sure they were in a pod with Matt Rogers and one of them took it in one of these worldwide tournaments. So, you know, I'm not only saying this off opinion, I'm saying this because we saw tournament results where NA is the best in for sure. Yeah, I, I played against Dante once in like the one of the first skirmishes, and it was I didn't realize who he was when I played him. It was only, I think I told you about the match later, but it's like the guy knew my hand. He's like, "Oh, you're doing this? Okay, I know exactly what's going on. I know how you built your deck. I know exactly how to anticipate it. Oh yeah, and I'm still gonna get to do what I want to do." And it was very intimidating to play against someone who's just that scary in the game. Uh, just no. skill wise and mentally wise, just to know the game. It was impressive to play against. It wasn't fun to play against, but it was impressive. Yeah, it felt the same way when I played him. Um, you know, I'm, you know, he was running Ira, which you know makes a lot of sense. But you know, just perfect. Not well, not perfect every time, but like the perfect amount of block, like to turn off turns, like and always following up with something. I actually haven't played him since the drone land, uh, drone band, so. Um, I'm not sure what he's running right now, but prior, um, it, it was definitely frightening. Uh, a lot of good play. Um, and, you know, back back to the main question, um, XP is great, and I've heard from a lot of people who play a lot of card games. Um, LSS has kind of the, you know, for what they say, they say LSS is direct to local tournament support or availability tournament support through GEM is some of the best a lot of these card players have ever seen. Personally, I haven't played in a lot of other card games to have a good opinion. I've only know Gem, and it's great. So XP, they thought, was the best system for them to implement. I know once we get Nationals and Worlds, you know, some players can get ELO, um, as there are, are, are players ELO ranked. Um, but um, ELO, ELO is the best way. To handle some of this. XP is great, I guess, for the invites, which is what they intended it for. But if, if I had a choice or if I fully believe that one was better than the other, like you asked, I would say ELO would be the best representation. Yeah. Um, but I, I was just curious what your stance is. I mean, I, I think yeah. that, you know, I mean, just because, just you know, I'm sure that there are going to be people blowing up the comments over, you know, their feedback on this and, and, and fair enough. You know, I, I, I mean, it's there's a very dis clear distinction on what happens in an ELO environment. In an ELO environment, you are disincentivized to play more at the top end. And LSS with an L XP system has encouraged people to go to their LGSs when those are not closed for COVID, right? So, I, I mean, I, I think fundamentally they've accomplished their primary goal. Now, will it be XP forever? Who who knows, right? I, I don't know. Um, but, you well, know, so you... They have the two two systems. So to get to the events that have ELO, you have to do the XP grind. And then once you make it to an event that would matter, um, they give you the ELO ranking there. Um, so that's a pretty good system. Um, but like if you wanted to gauge my skill versus Rob Seigel's, I don't think our like I don't think our XP on the board is a is a good way to measure it. All right, folks, uh, we're back after a, a glitch. Uh, I think that was my fault. That's why we've all changed positions. It was it was really a game of musical chairs. Uh, you know, Jake was able to go get a beer. So, I mean, that's really a win. So, all right. Um, all right, so we were closing out our, our ELO discussion. So let me move on to my second to last question, which is, again, if, if you know, if there are newbies out there who, who want to be you, right, what do you think the most valuable skill in fab is and I, I know that's kind of a sideways question so you can interpret it however however you want what do you think the most important thing to learn in fab is blocking blocking how to block good yeah so when i early on and we're talking a year ago you know there was very very little content out um there i, I 
know, I forget who wrote it, but it's on the Fab website. It might have been Carol, actually. Carol, I can't pronounce his last name. R- Ruskiewicz? Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're all Americans, and we'd always say things wrong, so sorry. I don't know what to tell you. Um, but it was pretty much talking about blocking. Um, you know, there was a, a, a bunch of other strategies in there, but what stood out to me, and I, you know, I posted it in the Discord and talk about this uh, to new players all the time, Blocking is the only thing that's free in the game. It's the only thing that costs you nothing but the card that you're blocking with. Defense reaction, you have to pitch to play it. Uh, attack action card, most of the time you have to pitch to play it. And if you don't, it still costs you the card. So the blocking is you know, just as efficient as a zero-cost attack card. Um, and um, blocking is... It, it, I feel that if you don't know what to do, block. And an opportunity will prevent itself. You know what I mean? Like, if if you're looking at your hand and it, it's it, it could be really good, it could be really bad, and you're feeling iffy on the scenario, might as well block because you know you still have a chance to arsenal. You still have a chance to maybe swing with your weapon and apply a slight bit of pressure. But you know, if it's a worst case scenario, you're blocking and just arsenaling. You now have a better chance. Get a better turn because you now have five cards instead of, um, you know, even if you use your whole hand to block, you still took zero damage. If you're at one life, you're still in the game. You still have a chance for them to have a downturn. You know, it can feel sometimes that your opponent is very oppressive, and you know, there's nothing you can do. But they'll eventually run out of good cards. They'll eventually have a bad hand, just like you, who's having bad hands up until this moment. Eventually, they won't always have fire and won't hit that point if you're dead. So blocking is just knowing when to block, knowing how much to block for, and if all else fails, just block as much as you can. Blocking, I think blocking is the most important thing to have. All right, fair enough. Um, All right, so before I ask my uh, final question, Josh, do you have anything else to uh, add? No, just to piggyback off of, of his answer, I think that you know, I came into it several months after Jake, and Jake was there when I was first learning. And I would say that blocking is what is helping me become more successful lately. Is I think it's just it's a very apt point. Is that you know, I had been playing for a while and playing different builds and different styles and trying to learn the game. But I really think that learning how to block and when to block has really made me a better player so for new players i think that's absolutely the right answer Jake nailed it. okay fair enough all right so the last question the fun question because there's no right or wrong answer right so you can't get in trouble for this one right so what are you looking forward to most when monarch spoilers start here in like i don't know a week or so what are you looking forward to most from monarch guardian boots guardian yeah generic uh, legendary boots or guardian legendary boots or mythic boots. Oh, so you're, you're, you you just want the full equipment suite. I see how it is. I see how it is. Okay. How about you, Josh? What are you looking forward to most? Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing um, just kind of new classes. I, I well, actually. Well, we're all wondering what the new classes will be and how their mechanics will be different from what we've seen and how it'll fill out the game. But I've become, with playing new classes and different classes and trying to understand the game a little bit better, I'm more interested in the generics that we're going to see that are going to apply to every class. So I want to yep. see some really cool generic. I want to see a mythic defense reaction. I want to see a, a, a mystic attack reaction. Like, kind of joking around it in our... Uh, Discord about you know a thunderstruck. It's an attack reaction plus eight, but you have to sing thunderstruck when you play it, or it doesn't count. Um, just something silly like that, but something that every class would have access to, and it's up to you to figure out how to fit it in with the, the builds for that class to make it fun and interesting. As we see new heroes come along, how do we make the old heroes uh, even cooler or, or adapt to to whatever new mechanics we're going to see? All right, that's 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 a good answer. I uh, I I don't know. I I'm personally scared. I'm really afraid that one of the classes we're gonna get is warrior, and it's just gonna make warrior better. <laughs> it's gonna be like an, a dark warrior or a light warrior, and I'm really afraid it's gonna make warrior better. Um, but I'm looking forward to so 
One of my favorite cards ever is Ravenous Rabble because it's just a functional card that everybody can use. And I'm kind of hoping for like another Rabble-esque card. Um, I mean, I, I'm not saying like in how Rabble works. I just mean like a functional card that can play for one or two and give you go again, right? I think that'd do a lot for my girl Azalea. And I don't know, we'll see where it goes from there, so... All right, well, I think we're about done for the night. We're definitely pushing our, our minutes. So do you have any parting shots or any shout-outs you want to give, Jake? Um, if, uh, if you can, play locally, support your LGS. Um, build your community. Um, playing online is great, um, but your local community is, it, in the long run, you'll have a lot more fun there than playing online. Uh, and the game will succeed. Um, if there's a demand for stores, and there's only one way to do that and play at your LGS. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. It's So actually, okay, I know I said we're going to get out of here, but I have a bonus question because Josh earlier said that you were instrumental in kind of helping get the locals off the ground. So I, I continually see people who are like, hey, i really into fab. I've been so into it for like the last 36 hours. It's like the greatest thing in my life for the last 36 hours. My LGS won't pick it up. Any advice for people like that on how to make them pick it up? Go play there. You know, you, I like that you answer. Can't get the cards from there. You know, it, it obviously it goes against what I said is you know support the LGS. But if if you get your cards how you can and go play somewhere, um, they'll see you playing it. A group will form. People want to play locally. Um, there's people who can't. So wherever you're playing, you know, you make enough noise about it, people will show up. And maybe you know, LGS will pick it up once they see that there's a demand for it. I mean, all, all it takes is for them to actually Google the game and they'll want to sell it. Even stores who carry it can't get enough of the product. So, you know, it's a win-win for everyone. But, you know, just bring your cards and your deck to an LGS or wherever you want to carry the game. I think that's a good point because that's kind of how it happened in our local group. At least to my knowledge, Fat Ogre was the only place in town to play in person or, or at all and then there were people who were like i don't want to drive that far so they just stopped driving that far and went to go play at dragon's lair and then dragon's lair is like hey what are you playing how do we sell you that product uh and then that's how we got two main houston stores now that don't compete time slot wise and there's a lot of people who play it both and i think jake and some of the other guys locally kind of drove that other store into picking it up. And now, you know, they have a pre-release uh, and they, they're getting product and they have their own group. And there's a lot of us that come mingle between both, but those things wouldn't have happened if really people just didn't want to drive as far and still wanted to play the game. And like Jake said, they just took their cards to another store, started playing it and the store wanted to support so, okay. so what I'm hearing from you guys is the, the way to get your store to pick it up is to be lazy and bully them into it. That's that's what I'm hearing. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Um, no, I, I'm joking, of course. Do not be a bully to your LGS. That's obviously a, a, a facetious statement, but go ahead, sir. I mean, it is yeah. easy in Houston to be like, mm, I could drive an hour or I could drive 40 minutes. Yeah. And okay. just a matter of... I don't want to drive in Houston traffic any farther than I have to. Um, well, so, you know, a few of our locals were saying that, um, you know, we have a few people who can't, you know, they have to drive two or three hours to get to either of these stores. Um, and they just started playing there uh, a few weeks ago, and they're, and they're carrying the game now. So, you know, actually in Houston, you can play Flesh and Blood on every day of the week but Friday in an event. Um, because people have just taken the cards and colonized their area with the game. It, you know, it just catches on like wildfire. Oh, I mean, I mean, fair enough. It's, no, I mean, and success breeds success. So you guys have a good thing going down there. You guys have been very fortunate that you haven't had those same lockdown restrictions as other people. Oh, Absolutely. Uh, Right. I mean, and, and well, I, I mean, for, I'm not making a political statement. Like you guys have been lucky because of the policy and y'all still alive. So I don't know, but you know, just take, take from that what you will, uh, the rest of the States. But, uh, anyway, all right. So I think it's time to about get out of here, but I do know there's one question that's going to pop up in the comments. What's your dog's name? Cause 
he and oh, or she's been in there for half the episode. Yeah, yeah, that that's popcorn, and he's awesome. Um, that's my girlfriend's dog, so he's my adopted dog. Um, but yeah, popcorn, acorn, peanut, whatever you want to call them, some kind of tree nut. All right, so thank you everyone for joining us for this episode of Dice Commando Go Again, featuring Peacorn. Because that's what we're really all here to see. But no, seriously, Jake, I, I want to thank you for taking. Yeah, I did too. He can get his feature. He can get his feature. Um, uh, no, but seriously, thank you for taking the time tonight. I know it's hard with our time zones to line up. So plus, you said you can play Fab every night of the week, which means if you're talking to me, you're not playing Fab right now. So that's that's a win too, right? So I, I am actually. So I was grinding a lot um, towards the end. Like I said, we have a lot of great players here in America and North America. You know, as a continent and some of them were giving me uh, definitely a run for my money so um i'm taking a break from playing every day for the next couple weeks until probably the monarch that's for sure well that's that's not that far away so you're bored you know i'm taking a step down oh fair enough well so josh want to thank you for arranging this uh everyone should understand this was 100 percent arranged by josh because um I, 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 I heard he beat him. I don't know. That's what I heard. So. <laughs> but uh, no, but in all seriousness, thank, thank you very much for taking the time tonight. I hope everyone enjoyed this. Uh, if you have questions for Jake or Josh or, or me, please leave them in the comments. I uh, just wanted to, again, give a shout out to their locals. We had Fat Ogre up in the Woodlands. If you're in the Houston area and you want to go learn how to play fab from this fine gentleman, or either of these fine gentlemen, you can go check them out. And we also have Dragon's Lair, which I think is between the two loops, I, I believe. Um, you can go check that out in Houston as as well. So, um, yeah, with that said, uh, any, any parting shots, gentlemen, before we get out of here? Uh, you know, I actually appreciate your time, my man. Um, you know, it's not every day I get to, you know, reach out to the community uh, through platforms such as yourself. So um, I definitely do appreciate it. Uh, your time. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Well, everybody's got to say it. Thank you and go commando. Yeah, right. Go commando, my man. All right.